Okay, here we go. Um, hi, uh, I think most of you know who I am. Uh, Nick Manacucci, I'm a professor at RMIT. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, tachyonic media in sonic relativity. Oops, hang on. So this talk is, it starts out with a talk that I gave that focused on the existence of sonic relativity. So um, I'll, I'll go through that in a faster speed than I do in the usual one, and then we'll get to the new results. And I'll try to make sure to finish in time for Magdalena to take off. Now, um, quick survey. How many people are have seen a talk by me or by one of my co-authors on sonic relativity um, and have some idea of how it works? Okay, so Dominic, Evan, Laura, I thought so. Uh, Nico and Rodrigo, have you guys seen one? Yeah, uh, not really. <laughs> Okay, all right, that's cool. So I won't go at lightning speed, but I will um, try to go at a reasonable speed. So here we go. Okay, so let's talk about Einstein, the radical. So he says, the laws of physics are the same for any inertial observer and the speed of light is constant. So of course, this is a bit of a funny one to pre-Einsteinian physics, like why would the speed of light be a constant? Um, this actually made sense for Galilean relativity, but this was the new thing. Um, Galilean relativity says that the only invariant speed is infinity, and uh, the, Lorentz, uh, the Lorentz transformation always has some finite speed that is a constant for all observers. Um, but of course, there was a sense of relativity before Einstein came along, they just didn't call it relativity. Uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment was in 1887, and that showed that the ether for light is undetectable. Um, Fitzgerald and Lorentz in the late 1800s showed that uh, objects contract when moving. Um, and this is with respect to some ether. And Larmer in 1900 shows that time slows for a moving object. Again, moving means with respect to some assumed to exist ether for light. Um, what does this mean? Well, this is from uh, a paper by John Bell uh, in his book, Speakable and Unspeakable in Quantum Mechanics. So for some reason, he uh, talks about relativity in that book, which is great. Um, so he's got this great um, uh, picture in there that talks about the electric field of a source at rest and of a source moving uh, uh, in the horizontal direction here. And what you see is that the, 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 the field lines are actually contracted so that um, the, the, the lines of constant potential are no longer circular, but they're actually ovals. Um, and so this is responsible, one could argue from a totally dynamical standpoint, that this is responsible for Lorentz contraction. Um, and this is what uh, Fitzgerald came up with. Um, but also because of this, um, this actually changes the dynamics. It changes the time that it takes an electron to orbit an atom at rest. So, it, it, sorry, when it's moving. So if, it's a, if it takes um, time t when it's at rest, it takes a time gamma times t when it's moving. Now, in order to get this, you actually need um, to slightly modify the, dis, uh, the, the momentum uh, the definition of momentum. Uh, but you can get most of the way there just by considering how the electric field uh, transforms under motion. And this is actually a dynamical effect. So if you take the proton and, and it's moving past you and you look at what an electron would do around it, it would take longer to go around the proton and it would be moving in an oval rather than in a circle. Um, of course, it's an oval that's that's moving down the road, but um, I, you know, I digress. Um, if if the electron were actually classical, if it did not have a relativistic dispersion relation, then it would the, the actual exact calculations would be a little bit different, but it would be basically the same. Uh, so you'd get the basic idea of contraction and time dilation. So objects held together by electromagnetic forces will naturally Fitzgerald contract and Larmer dilate because these guys came up with these. Um, uh, physical dynamical effects um, when they when they are accelerated. So it is it is the acceleration that actually does the deformation, and then once they're moving, this is the steady state. So that's how I mean this is this actually comes out of the physics. Okay, so if we take an empirical approach, we could modify this second postulate to say, okay, yeah, laws of physics are the same for any inertial observer, but the speed of light is always measured to be a constant. We can go with that. Um, so we talk about light clocks. Well, we know what a light clock is. Um, it's it's uh, it, it's a device that just bounces light back and forth, and and you uh, you use this to make an argument that if a light clock is moving, 
then it takes longer to go. It's a longer distance to travel because um, it has to go at an angle. And because light travels at the same speed, according to the postulate, then um, this light clock will tick more slowly. Okay, well, that all sounds fine. And this is often how it's taught, taught in undergraduate physics. Um, moving light clocks take longer to tick than stationary ones since the speed of light is constant. Okay, fine. But what's so special about light? This is something that bugged me for many years. And I'm not the only one that it bugged because in the physics forums, in I got this in 2014, there's this uh, uh, wonderfully astute guy, Siddharth5129. He says, hi, so the whole premise of special relativity seems to me to be hinged on the immutability of the speed of light. Fact is, it's the same for every inertial frame of reference, and the fact that information and energy cannot travel faster than this. Two concepts that are actually logically distinct, by the way. So um, that it's the same and that it's a speed limit. Those are two logically distinct propositions. What really puzzles me is this whole traveling forward in time thing. While I can appreciate the use of the twin paradox as a pedagogical device, would a moving frame of reference at a comparable to light speed actually affect how fast a biological system in that frame ages? Now, this is a very good question because if you're teaching relativity using light clocks, that doesn't say anything about how the heart or the, the, the brain or the blood or anything else in a human body operates. Um, so that's a relevant question. It's a very good question. So Tom Storr uh, shows up and uh, tries to help. He says, I think the pedagogical problem is that time dilation, twin paradox, and differential aging is introduced in terms of reference frames and coordinate times. So his solution is, in my opinion, one should better start with proper times of the two observers. Like, okay, well, if you already know what proper times are, then that's fine. But Siddharth doesn't buy this. He says, why does light have to be this ultimate signal then? What if we used sound for all our timekeeping? Brilliant question, Siddharth. Do the postulates of relativity not hold that the signal is mechanical rather than electromagnetic? Uh, sorry, hang on. So that one, okay, good. So Tom responds, uh, responds. So in a sense, there is no aging of light and one can use it to compare proper times without distorting them. That's why one is using light signals when explaining special relativity. But please keep in mind, that the effect does not depend on the exchange of light signals. It is a purely geometrical effect geometrical effect. He doesn't say dynamical, he says geometrical. And there's no need to exchange light signals at all. Okay. Um, Siddharth says, I'm sorry, I don't understand at all what you mean by aging of light. So I really like that response because he's like, what are you talking about, dude? What are you smoking here? No aging of light. So Simon Bridge shows up and he has a different perspective. So he says the current state of knowledge is that biological organisms are subject to the same physical laws in the same way as everything else. If it holds for a light clock, it must hold for all clocks, including biological ones. Okay, so this is where Siddharth gets really smart. He says, but it doesn't hold for sound clocks, does it? If the speed of sound is different in an inertial reference frame, then sound clocks wouldn't display time dilation. I say this because the argument in my textbook that derives the time dilation relation seems to hinge on using a light clock and the fact that the speed of light is the same in both the earth frame of reference and the train frame of reference. Am I mistaken in saying that speed of sound is indeed different in both frames of reference because sound is a mechanical wave? Very good questions. And then he later says, I'm sorry, I'm still very confused. What if the twin in the space shuttle balances a ball to keep time? Say there's no air friction. Since this is a periodic phenomenon, it's a valid way to keep time, but an observer on earth will record the same time interval for any two events that the observer in the space shuttle records if time is kept in this manner, hence no time dilation. And no link contraction. This makes absolutely no sense. What am I missing here? So Siddharth is proposing, he says, all right, I've heard of light clocks. Well, what about sound clocks? Let's bounce sound back and forth. What about a bouncy ball clock? And what about a biological clock? Like why, what, what's going on here? Why are we using light and not sound? Well, um, I would like to say that there is no duration, there are only clocks. There is no distance, there are only rulers. And this is in the spirit of Einstein who said, what is time? Time is what is measured by a clock. 
Um, it's a very physical, it's a very operational approach. That doesn't mean that 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 these uh, that, that durations and, and distance have no meaning. It just means that they're not the primary objects of the theory. Okay, so let's talk about other clocks. So the usual explanation given by Tom here is that time dilation is fundamental and all clocks somehow read, quote, proper time. Now, to me, this seems a little disconnected from any kind of dynamics of the world. I would argue that the true to Einstein explanation is that all clocks are physical objects and therefore subject to the Lorentz symmetry of those physical laws. So the physical laws that we have have a natural Lorentz symmetry to them with the speed of light being the Lorentz invariant speed. And because of that, all the physical objects that, that uh, are, are composed of those particles have the same symmetry built in. Okay, now the pre-Einstein explanation. Oh, oh, and this I believe is what Simon was trying to say. Uh, that these are physical objects and the same laws, same symmetries that the world apply to these objects. So the pre-Einstein explanation is that clocks experience dynamical Larmor dilation due to the physics of electromagnetism holding them together. Now, of course, we know that there's a little bit more to this story because we need to mess with the momentum to account for the relativistic motion of the electron. Um, but this is, I mean, this gets you a large portion of the way there. So it seems like the usual explanation is the odd one out because we're talking about some weird quantity called proper time. Well, what the hell is that? I think that these actually naturally fit together a lot better because we're talking about dynamics. We're talking about, it doesn't matter how you describe it. You can describe in proper time, you can describe in coordinate time, but what's happening in either case is that there's a dynamical, uh, when, when something moves from at rest to uh, some velocity, it has to undergo acceleration and that's gonna actually deform it ever so slightly. And so this usual explanation, geometrical one is the odd one out. So I, if we take relatively, relativity seriously, then time dilation is the slowing of moving clocks as measured by stationary ones. Now, the funny thing is that you can choose any fiducial reference frame to define your moving or stationary, but you can. And length contraction is the shortening of moving rulers as measured by stationary rulers. These statements are about the physics of clocks and rulers. It's about how they change their shape and their, their, their evolution, not about, quote, space or time. And this distinction is, is really important. So Sky Siddharth said, what if we use sound for all our timekeeping? Do the postulates of relativity not hold if the signal is mechanical rather than electromagnetic? Well, let's turn to sonic relativity. So sonic relativity is sometimes called analog gravity. Um, it's a Lorentz ether model. Now, what that means is that it's a, a model that has a Lorentz symmetry um, but it has an actual definite ether. So this is a bulk fluid or other material, oh, hang on, uh, that forms the background spacetime. Insofar as small perturbations see this uh, possibly curved background in their equations of motion. So if you look at the propagation of um, uh, fluctuations in a fluid, and that fluid has some motion or some changes in density or some other things, then uh, those th that has the same form as a relativistic wave equation uh, with uh, a metric in it. So um, this was first talked about in acoustic black holes. So we've got a region of supersonic flow. It's like a drain. And uh, this was proposed by Unruh, experimental black hole evaporation back in 1981. And then there was an experiment done in water, in a water tank uh, that uh, said measurement of stimulated Hawking emission in an analog system, that was in 2011. So the figures are from a, a Living Reviews and Relativity article on analog gravity. So this is a well-established concept that you can, you can exploit the Lorentz symmetry in uh, a sonic system. Okay, so uh, when we look at the mathematics of this, we could consider a non-relativistic system. So this I find kind of interesting. You start with a totally non-relativistic system, Newtonian, uh, coupled pendula, and you can write down the Lagrangian for this system. And what you do, so the time derivatives here, and we say that the pendula are coupled to the nearest neighbor, 
Now, um, some of you may know that uh, Dominic, Nico, and I have been looking at band-limited systems where these are coupled more um, extensively. But for now, I'm just going to be talking about the uh, um, the usual case where you just take the spacing to be zero. So I'll do that in a second. Um, it's a brief digression there. And then there may be, um, there's this, this uh, term that's related to the fact that, that it's actually swinging from a pendulum arm. So there's a restoring force. And so we have this sum. Um, if we write these uh, prefactors in a suggestive way like this, depending on delta x, then we can turn this into a, um, uh, this is a density, this is a uh, uh, tension, and uh, this is a density times some resonant frequency squared. And so uh, this is a sonically relativistic scalar field with the speed of sound equal to the square root of tension over the density. Um, so interestingly, we get relativity, sonic relativity, one dimensional, um, at least in the motion of, of these, uh, the, the background field out of a completely non-relativistic physics. Okay, that's fine. Um, so the sonically relativistic limit for this um, in the massless case, which approximates the massless field, when you have an extremely long pendulum arm, you have very tightly spaced uh, masses, and you have a low pendulum mass, and they're weakly coupled, such that all of those parameters are kept constant. Um, alternatively, you can uh, say that the length scale of the pendulum is less than any relevant length scale in the problem, any one that you can measure, and that's much less than this uh, C over omega naught. So in terms of a dispersion relation, uh, we have omega here and K there. Um, what we actually get is something that looks like this. And what we're saying is, if we want a truly relativistic dispersion relation for a massless particle, we'd be looking at this. Now, of course, it's going to bend over uh, up here because it's actually um, a, a discrete model. But um, in the limit where it, it gets very small, we just ignore that. We just say it's, it's approximately relativistic in this regime. OK, so that's just to say it's plausible. But this is more of a, um, actually more of a philosophy of physics talk um, motivated by actual calculations. Um, so uh, we don't need to worry about the details of, of exactly how to do this. We're just going to say this, this regime exists. It's fine. OK, so here's the question that I wanted to answer and that we did answer um, about uh, six years ago. Um, what observers experience this sonic relativity? Sonic observers, do they exist? Well, OK, here's the, here's the conundrum. The actual when I say actual, I mean the laboratory physics. We all know what laboratory physics is. It's the physics that goes on in the laboratory, not some fictitious thing that we're talking about. It's just whatever the hell goes on in your lab using the laws of physics as we know it. So the actual laboratory physics is non-relativistic in this model. It's well described by Newtonian physics, maybe non-relativistic quantum physics, but there's no relativity in it. Now, of course, we know that all the particles actually are standard model, blah, 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 blah. But they're well described of what's happening in this laboratory with Pendula uh, or fluid flow in a non-relativistic framework. OK, but here's the thing. You can't just willy-nilly drag a microphone over the surface and somehow get time dilation or some sort of, um, I mean, you'll get a Doppler effect, but it won't be a relativistic Doppler effect. It'll be something else. Um, and we can't just use rulers from the lab. Like if, 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 if I put a ruler next to a flow, the flowing water, the ruler doesn't suddenly get shorter. I mean, that would be absurd. Okay, so, and the speed of sound is not a constant. It's only a constant with respect to the medium, the sonic ether. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, it seems like you know, we'd have to do more work to get, a, to get an observer that actually sees the relativity. We know that it's there mathematically. So the question is what observers could actually see it? No, sonic observers. So we did this and published in 2017. Um, sonic observers are observers that um, they're, they're toy model hypothetical observers. They can count one, two, three, four, five. They can locally discern before, after, and simultaneous, um, but only locally. They can send and receive sound pulses. They can hear. They can communicate information or instructions, but there's no other measurements. Like they don't, they're not aware of their own heartbeat. Um, they're not able to measure Doppler shifts. They don't have any more complicated um, equipment. So if we restrict their ability to measure in this way, then what could they do? Um, well, this is where we say um, enter the bat. So this is some content that I used in the 
um, a couple of week, uh, couple of weeks, I taught special relativity to first year students. So I talked about sound clocks. So here we have um, bats. We know they use sonar to locate things. So um, in this picture, I'm going to talk about a sound clock. So a sound clock is two bats that are placed some distance apart. And the first one emits a sound, uh, some sort of sonar. The second one, when, when, when he hears it, emits a return pulse. And when the first bat hears the return pulse, um, just increments by one. So this is effectively, this two bat system is a sound clock. Uh, okay, fine. Um, let me know if there's any questions with this. Uh, but what the question, natural question would be, what happens if this thing's moving? Well, if the sound clock is moving, um, notice that the sound waves propagate at a constant speed with respect to the background, with respect to the medium. And what that means, if we just do it again, is that the stationary clocks uh, ha has received its initial sound pulse at the top, but the moving clock is running away from its sound pulse. Okay, well, we know that because the sound is propagating um, uh, equally in all directions. So the stationary clock emits its reflection pulse sooner than the moving one. Okay, now the moving clock's pulse has caught up. Um, the stationary clock's reflection pulse is already on its way. Um, moving clock emits the reflection pulse, and then this one has already received it, but um, the moving clock is still on its way. And you'll notice that the discrepancy here is larger than it was before. You may not see that, but it is. Um, and so this is actually moving more slowly. So the stationary clock has ticked, but this one hasn't already ticked. So if you let this go for a number of cycles, you'll see that there's actually a, a constant rate at which um, the moving one is going more slowly. Okay, and this is because uh, sound in a moving clock travels further at the same speed. So that, that's what happens. Um, the stationary one just has to go up and back, and this one actually has to travel a further distance. It's the same logic for the light clock. Um, so, but this is according to Newton's laws. There's no relativity here. This is Newton's laws. Moving sound clocks tick more slowly than stationary ones. Okay, fine. How, more, how much more slowly? Well, it turns out that we can define a fractional speed of sound, V over CS, and we can define a sonic gamma factor as such. And we find that one tick, which is how long it takes to go up and back of the moving clock is equal to gamma ticks, oh, sorry, is equal to gamma ticks of the stationary clock. So it's the same mathematics as well. So we can make a sound ruler in an analogous way by having two pulses that go out and come back. Um, and the point is that they come back at the same point at the same time. So the observers can check that. Um, we're just assuming that they can discern between these two pulses. Um, all of those things are just practical considerations. The point is that they, they can, it is reasonable to set up a situation like this. Um, so a moving sound ruler needs to be closer together in order to stay synchronized according to the operational definition that I gave. So the operational definition is that the pulse is going out and coming back, need to come back at the same time. And that is because um, you can kind of see it. Uh, the, in essence, the back of the sound ruler is, well, both, all of the sound ruler is running away from the pulses, from the return pulse. So that's why it has to be closer together. It just, it just turns out that that's the key. Um, I actually go through and do this again, but you don't really need to see that. You can just see what happens. Um, so it's behind. Um, and what we see is that the initial motion is very quick. The initial pulse is very quick. It's very fast. So actually um, with respect to the bats, we transform the bat, Galilean transform to the bats reference frame. Then for them, there's a wind. There's an ether wind, and and the the speed of sound is going to be different in the four is going to be a lot faster uh, in the. Hang on, which way does this go? Oh, I'm gonna get this wrong. They're moving this way, so it's going to be faster in that direction than it is in that direction. So it takes less time to go here than it does to go there. Um, and it just turns out that they have to be closer together to synchronize their spacing and timing pulses. And this is all again according to Newton's laws. Nothing relativistic here apparently. And yet we get the same mathematics of relativity. So the same definitions. And we see that one space, some thing of a moving ruler is equal to one over gamma spaces of a stationary ruler. So it's, it's actually um, uh, the, the, 
Uh, yeah, so the tick marks are closer together on the moving ruler. Okay, so we can make reference frames out of these bats. We just zoom out and we say, okay, so you know, we call this location zero, location one, et cetera. And we can make reference frames and operationally defined units. So we can define a tick as the duration of a single round trip of the sound pulse and the sound clock and the space of the distance traveled by the, um, there's a synchronization pulse for this. Anyway, um, the point of this is that the, um, the, the speed of sound as measured by these guys is one space per tick in any frame. So that means that, that these bats with their restrictions on how they can do measurements will perceive the speed of sound to be the same in any frame. Now we know that it's not. We know that if you're moving with respect to the medium, the speed of sound is gonna be different in different directions, anisotropic. But here, they don't see that because of the way they have operationally constructed their clocks and rulers. And they get an operational Lorentz transformation just like we do, all from Newton's laws, all from Newton's laws and restrictions on how they can make measurements. Um, so that's, that's what happens. So according to Newton's laws, this is the really important thing. Observers limited to using sound clocks and sound rulers cannot tell whether they are in motion or stationary. I wanna emphasize that one more time. According to Newton's laws, nothing relative to secure at all. Newton's laws and limitations on how they can make measurements, observers limited to using sound clocks and sound rulers cannot tell whether they are in motion with respect to the ether or stationary. It's undetectable to them. That's interesting. Okay, so if there's an observer living in this universe, call called Sonic Einstein. So you can say, okay, the laws of physics for sonic observers are the same in an inertial reference frame. And the speed of sound is always measured to be constant when we use sound-based clocks and rulers. So this is what Sonic Einstein might, might say. That all makes sense. So if we take this seriously, then time dilation is the slowing of moving clocks, et cetera. It's all the same thing. Um, and this is, this is still the case because these clocks actually have um, contracted. I'm uh, sorry, the rulers have contracted and the clocks literally have slowed down. But what's funny about this is that from the outside, there is one frame in which the, the rulers are as, as large as they will ever be. In any other frame, they will be, you know, in, in any other frame, they will be shorter. But there's one frame, which is the frame at which they're at rest with respect to the medium, they're gonna be large, but they can't see this. The sonic observers cannot see that. To them, any frame is as good as any other. They have no way of detecting their motion with respect to the actual medium that we know exists. They can't see it. Um, and so they get a recipro uh, reciprocity of the Lorentz transformation. I haven't shown that in simple calculation based on the, what we have, but um, they can't see it, which is weird. So you get this um, uh, asynchronicity and uh, you know, they, they, they don't see uh, uh, lack of simultaneity and all of that, uh, just like we do, except with CS instead of C. Okay, so a brief summary is, yes. relativity concerns the behavior, the dynamics of physical objects. I'm taking a dynamical interpretation. Local objects and observers, as well as their capabilities, are a crucial component because if you change what they can use, then they, will, they may see something different. Non-relativistic laboratory system can nevertheless give rise to a sonic relativity. And Siddharth will say, sonic observers using sound-based clocks and rulers naturally respond to this relativity. So I've, I've I've, I've given him what he wanted, um, but in order to get what he wanted, which was that the sound-based clocks and rulers uh, reveal this relativity, we have to use sonic observers. Uh, otherwise you don't, you don't see the results. Okay, so what could break it? It's a natural question. I mean, we've, we've really restricted things. We've said, okay, in this very small area of parameter space, if you do all these very special things, then you see sonic relativity. Okay, well, what breaks it? What, what makes you not see it? Well, um, obviously a measurement made using anything other than sound. So um, for instance, uh, your heartbeat, a meter stick or a ball clock. So I use these two floating astronauts um, in my class as well. So they toss a ball back and forth. And if we neglect the uh, mass, the momentum transfer between them, which would make them go further away, you just imagine that they're some fixed distance. Um, then using this, this is all Newtonian. So this would not have any time dilation 
there would not be any length contraction. And that's because there, this ball has some inertia. So when it's in motion, um, not only does it have to go farther, but it goes faster because it's a lump of material. Now, of course, we know because of relativity that it actually obeys a regular light speed based relativity. But with respect to um, Newtonian mechanics, you wouldn't see any of that. So that's, that's interesting. There are things that do not uh, show sonic relativity. So if you use anything other than the sound clocks, you wouldn't see that. Um, what else breaks it? Well, you might consider that scattering of sound from a Newtonian particle might break it. And we did some work uh, that, that tried to argue this. Um, and so this was, ah, uh, oh, I should have put uh, Jacqueline's name on there as well. Um, although we're gonna refute some of the conclusions in this. Uh, but I really should put them in there anyway. So um, my PhD student, Scott Todd and Giacomo Pantaleoni, um, Valentina Bacchetti uh, was my postdoc at the time. Now she's an independent um, research fellow here. And uh, myself, um, we published a paper called Particle Scattering in a Sonic Analog of Special Relativity. And we showed that if you have a particle, um, so imagine you have, um, okay, so you got these sound, these sonic observers in a sonic universe and they can send sound pulses back and forth. And let's imagine they can do some rudimentary experiments. So if they were to do a sonic analog of Compton scattering off of something, then they'd be scattering a phonon off of something. So if that something that they were scattering off of was say an electron or some sort of other Newtonian particle, a speck of dust or something, something that doesn't have the dispersion relation that their phonon does. If you scatter off of that, then the conservation of energy and momentum, as we know, has to be done in the laboratory, not in their fictitious universe. Uh, but, but the conservation of energy and momentum happens in the laboratory. And so the scattering will actually depend on their state of motion with respect to the medium, uh, because the, the speck of dust doesn't care about the medium. It doesn't see it. Uh, so you can engineer a situation where in one case, the speck of dust is at rest with respect to the medium and the sonic observers are at rest. Phot phonon comes in and scatters off of it and then it goes in. So that's, um, that's the, the picture that we have here. Um, but the other picture that we have is where the dust particle is actually moving. So if you look at my video, it's actually moving in this direction, but so are the sonic observers. And so to them, the dust particle is, is relatively stationary. Uh, so, but from the external frame, of course, they're both moving. Uh, and so they're in from the ether frame, they're both moving. And so there's a, 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 a according to a Lorentz transformation, those, those should be the same. So if this were a relativistic particle, a sonically relativistic particle, then they would see no difference. But because it is a, um, it's a, it breaks the sonic Lorentz invariance, then you actually see very different behavior here. So this is the probability density of scattering in a bunch of different directions. Um, so the blue one is if it's at rest, um, and then you have uh, beta is one tenth the speed of sound, um, you get a preferential scattering um, into the ether wind. So we said, we made the argument that, okay, the observers would probably be able to detect their motion with respect to the ether. And that's true. If they believed that they were, they lived in an ether universe, they could use this to detect that. But how would they interpret these results? If they actually got this scattering, how would they interpret these results? Okay, well, here's a pictures at the bottom. Option one is what I just said. They could say phonons, the things that we've been assuming are relativistic, actually travel through an ether. We can't see it with our normal equipment, but we could make an equipment out of these dust particles and just use that to, to say, okay, well, there's someone, there's some observer who is at rest with respect to the ether. And we just know that that observer, um, that's the only way we can see it, but we can see it. Um, so this is physically accurate from the lab perspective. They recognize that they're living in an ether universe, but it breaks their sonic Lorentz symmetry. So they, they're hesitant to do that because they're like, okay, I got this weird particle but everything else around me seems to obey this sonic relativity. So why should I throw all that out just because of this one lone anomaly? And that makes sense. So then the question is, how do they see it? What if they, if they, if they doubled down on their sonic relativity, what would it look like? And this is the other option. Now, 
I'm not showing the mathematics because I want to get to the content. However, if you, if you have questions on how we do this, I can do that at the end. Um, the brief answer is that if you write down the Lagrangian for a, uh, a, a regular old scalar particle, uh, like a, or like a scalar photon, let's say. So something that's massless or even massive, it doesn't matter, some scalar particle. And you, you can rewrite it in terms of the local sonic Lorentz uh, covariant coordinates that the sonic observers would use. And what you would see is that there's an extra term that appears in the Lagrangian. And that extra term has the exact same form as the, ex uh, well, that has, that has a given form. And now we go the other way around. We say, let's write the equation about the, the Lagrangian for the phonon field using our coordinates, our laboratory coordinates. And we say, let's rewrite this so that it looks like it's a regular old um, scalar particle. And what we get is an extra term when we do that. The two terms have the same form. The only difference is what the, uh, uh, the, fec the effect of the, 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 rel the ratio of the two speeds. So in one case, the term has, uh, the, the term is such that the um, speed of the particle is much, much, greater than the speed of the observer. That would be light as opposed to read by the sonic observers. On the other hand, if we look at the phonons, um, that speed, the speed of the particle is much, much less than the speed of the observers. So um, the observer symmetry that is. So the phonon has a much smaller speed of propagation than our Lorentz invariant speed. But nevertheless, they look the same. And so this is another option. The external particle travels through an ether. So now I want you to think about how strange this is. Because we know that external particles like photons and electrons and all the rest of it do not travel through an ether. That is bedrock physics for over hundred years. They do not travel through an ether. And yet these sonic observers, if given access to one of our native particles, our speed of light native particles, they could logically reason, look, I don't know what this thing is. It's a little bit weird it seems to have a natural rest frame. It seems to behave as if it were an excitation in some sort of medium. It's just going very, very fast. And I don't know what to make of that. Okay, so we'll tell you what, what to make of it. So the, 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 the benefits of this are that the velocity dependent effects that they see right here are are relative to the rest frame of the external particles ether. That's how they would interpret it. This preserves sonic Lorentz symmetry for them, but it's at the expense of assigning an ether to say the photon. So these sonic observers, their natural inclination is to believe that the photon that they're scattering off of actually, actually has an ether, even though we know it doesn't. But to them, that's what they would see. Okay, so let's talk about this possibility. External particles as tachyons. So, I mean, what happens to this interpretation of the external particles of photon, let's say? Well, photons are always traveling faster than sound. Electrons may be at rest, but photons are always traveling faster than sound. They appear like sonic tachyons. Okay, well, when you hear tachyon, you should immediately think temporal paradox. Okay, so what's going on with that? How come there isn't one? Well, here's the standard scenario for a temporal paradox. Um, it's the standard scenario by which faster than light signaling is argued to admit causality violation. So causality violation occurs if an observer, so here's a space-time diagram. This is one observer in the XT coordinate system. We've labeled it a sonic observer just because we're considering tachyons to be sonic tachyons, not actual tachyons. Here's another, um, observer in the sonic universe, and this is their Lorentz transformed coordinate system. Maybe it's like this for you guys. Anyway, um, so what we have is one observer at rest uh, sends a tachyonic signal at very close to infinite speed, according to them. Um, you can make it as large as you want. I mean, the speed of light is many orders of magnitude bigger than the speed of sound, so it might as well be close to infinite, so that's fine. So it goes out almost flat, and then what you can do is you can say at this event B, there is an observer moving at some very fast sonic, you know, uh, 0.9, you know, Mach 0.9 or something, um, then receives the signal 
and then sends it back. So if, if they could do that, then uh, this person would be sending it back in a perfectly space-like fashion, if that's the rule. If the rule is tachyons can be sent in a space-like fashion in, from any reference frame, then you get a paradox because what happens is that the signal is received at this x equals zero location before the outgoing signal was sent. And this can create obvious paradoxes. Um, so you don't want this because this doesn't, this makes your theory not make sense. This is called the tachyonic anti-telephone. You could send a message that says, don't send that message. And now you have a paradox. Okay, so this is a well-known uh, paradox, but it requires that these tachyons obey uh, relativity. So um, see what that means in a second. Um, so we know that temporal paradoxes cannot happen in sonic relativity, because again, the laboratory physics, the actual physics that's happening is free of such paradoxes. So the question is, how does this resolve for the internal observers? We know from the outside that it can't be there. And yet, if you have tachyons, you might get these paradoxes. We know they can't be there from the outside. Well, how do the sonic observers say, oh, it makes sense that they're not there. We try to use this protocol, what goes wrong? That's, that's, that's the issue. Ah, this thing goes wrong. Let's find out what it is. Well, the solution is that because the tachyons are confined to a rest frame, Photons are not actually confined to a rest frame, but to the sonic observers, they see them as if they were. And because of that belief, that reasonable belief based on evidence, uh, it turns out that that prohibits retrocausal signaling as we can see next. So to, to understand this, let's talk about sonic media and tachyonic media. So tachyonic medium is a term that we made up to describe uh, we defined, I suppose, to describe the situation. So a sonic medium is an ordinary medium um, that has a rest frame that's made of matter and it carries phonons. And phonons are tardionic particles with respect to regular relativity. Um, so for some observer, you can talk about a particle that's going slower than their Lorentz invariant speed. That's a tardionic particle. Um, the, and you can talk about a medium that carries such particles. Nothing wrong with that. We have that all the time. There's one right here on the desk. Um, so the motion of the sonic medium, this ether, creates an anisotropy in sound propagation. So if it's at rest, this drum head has um, isotropic propagation of sound. If it's moving, then it's anisotropic. It goes faster in one direction than it does in the other because of the motion there. Okay, but again, we argued that the sonic observers can't see that motion. So they don't see this thing at rest. What they see at rest is a quote, medium for let's say light, which is very strange. And yet to them, it's a totally reasonable uh, um, deduction from what they see. So we would say that, a, the, that they see light as propagating through a tachyonic medium. So a tachyonic medium, um, oh, I shouldn't have said ordinary, sorry. It's a medium that has a rest frame and carries tachyons. It's not the same as a sonic medium. It's a, it's a different type of object, but it is some sort of rest frame. Uh, it's an, some sort of object that can carry excitations and it has some sort of rest frame. And these excitations travel faster than the Lorentz invariant speed. The motion of the tachyonic medium, this ether, creates anisotropy in tachyon propagation in exactly the same way. So here I've drawn it backwards because from our perspective, the sonic medium is moving this way. Um, but from their perspective, the tachyonic medium is moving in the other direction. That's what they see. Okay, so if that's the case, then what happens? Well, in this case, we have a different diagram. Same observers, same attempt to use the um, tachyonic anti-telephone. But in this case, um, when they send the pulse out, it's almost flat. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that it's slightly not flat here. Um, it, they send the pulse out and it always travels, the, this, this tachyon always travels at the same speed with respect to this observer. It always travels at the same speed with respect to this observer. It does not, the tachyon does not move at the same speed with respect to this observer. And that's what does it. So the tachyons are conf confined to a rest frame that is shared by the um, observer sending and receiving. And so that means that the return pulse is not sent at the same, uh, you know, in, in, in the same direction, which would create a paradox. It's actually sent forward in time. And so to the uh, sonic observers, they see the confinement of the tachyons to a medium to resolve or to, to prevent um, temporal paradoxes. 
So here's a picture of what, hap what happens. Um, these are a bunch of different uh, possible um, velocity cones, if you will. So sigma is just the, the ratio of um, how fast the tachyon is going compared to the speed of sound. Um, this is from our paper. I just put this here for my own benefit. You can read it if you want, but, um, or if there's questions. But, uh, but these are signal velocities, so in, in units of speed of sound. So if the signal velocity is one, then you have this cone. And um, th this is the same picture, but from the moving frame. So in this case, we have two observers. Once again, one of them is moving with respect to the other, and here the other is moving with respect to the one, if you will. Um, so this is in the prime coordinates. And what we see is that the sigma equals one wedge is, is invariant under the sonic Lorentz transformation, but all the other higher speed wedges are not invariant. And in fact, once you get to uh, a high enough um, uh, tachyon velocity, uh, there is th there are no, um, uh, what, what's the deal here? There, there are no um, planes of simultaneity anymore. Um, and so this is what happens. So if you get a velocity, a signal velocity that is, that is really, really fast, like this one, this yellow one, then uh, sure, um, from this frame, it will go out like this and come back like this. But from this, uh, from this perspective, it will actually go backwards in coordinate time. Uh, but then on the return trip, look at the other yellow line that it's gonna follow. It's actually going to go so it's going to get sent out here. And then the return trip, it's going to get sent out here. So, oh, damn it. So it still goes forward in time from this perspective. Because if you look at this, I, I can't put my hand, well, okay, fine. So you have um, this one first, and then later you have this one. And the net result is that it goes positive in time. So um, it's the confinement to a medium that preserves uh, chronology, I suppose, or causality. Okay. so. Um, I have two slides on insights. Um, so the first is the insights from sonic relativity in general. Uh, so I would, this is a bit of soapboxing, um, by which I mean, these are just some ideas that I had uh, that, that seem to be true. Uh, so relativity naturally occurs with wave-like phenomena. And that's because if you have a constant speed of sound with respect or speed of propagation with respect to some medium, then you're gonna get a relativistic um, dispersion relation. Um, I'm sure you can construct one that's not true, but that seems to naturally occur. So appropriately constructed sonic observers will perceive this sonic relativity. Relativistic quantum mechanics, so because of this one, relativistic quantum mechanics without fields is relativistically misguided because of this, that I'm, I'm making an argument here and I'm being a bit provocative. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't actually proven this, but I would say that that relativity and wave-like phenomena are, they play very nicely together. And so why would you try to make quantum mechanics without using wave-like stuff? It seems relativistically misguided. Everything is pointing to waves as being the carriers of this information or fields really, excitations and fields. Um, the existence of an ether does not imply operational Lorentz violation. You can have an ether without violating Lorentz uh, symmetry. And that's what the sonic observers show us. There is an actual ether, but they can't see it. Uh, a dynamical approach to relativity lets us take this seriously. The fact that acceleration literally deforms objects. So it's not the velocity that deforms them. It's the forces of acceleration that deform them. And then once they get into steady states, you know, there's a deceleration that happens to get them moving at a constant velocity. But that whole process altogether, once it gets up to constant velocity, all these things conspire to make the object literally shorter as it's moving. It's literally shorter. And it's the only reason we don't see it shorter is because you either have to slow it down, in which case it expands again, or you yourself have to speed up, in which case every, all of your processes shrink to match it. Um, so I would, this is the perspective that I like. Such a, deforma such a deformation is of a special type due to the Lorentz symmetry of the dynamical laws of physics. It can be operationally undone, like I just said, when an observer undergoes acceleration up to the same velocity. And there's no way to rule out the Lorentz ether theory in special relativity. I don't know about general, but you know, it's any observer can claim to be at absolute rest. It's a nonsensical claim because no one can disprove, but no one can disprove it. So you can't prove it, and no one can disprove it. Whatever that is. Um, but I I like the idea that that we can. If this perspective gives us some uh, insight into tachyon. So. Sonic observers can maintain their sonic Lorentz symmetry 
even in the presence of external tachyonic particles like photons or electrons or dust. But let's say photons for concreteness and, and extremeness. Velocity dependent effects that we would ascribe to the fact that they live in an ether universe, they can ascribe to the tachyons having an ether. And this is mathematically valid, and I can show you that if you want. And this prevents the paradoxes that normally occur with tachyons. In reality, the observers are perceiving their own motion with respect to the sonic medium, but this is not the simplest explanation that they would give for the data that they're getting. They would say, well, why are we throwing out all of this? It just seems like this thing is, is the one odd, odd one out. Now, here's a key distinction that I was talking about earlier. I foreshadowed this. The Lorentz invariant speed in a relativistic model, model need not be the maximum signal speed. Those are two different concepts. If you can signal by exciting a tachyonic medium, you don't violate any paradoxes, but you can still, if you want to, hold on to your regular old Lorentz symmetry. It may be that that's the simpler way to do it. And it turns out this is a generic feature of all, relative, uh, of, of all relativistic models, that you can pick one speed to be invariant. If you pick the speed of light, you do very well in simplifying your model, but you could, if you wanted to pick it in a different one. Um, so finally, this suggested the discovery of actual tachyons, if that were to ever occur. May, it's, it's possible to both preserve Lorentz symmetry and be paradox free. If, for instance, the tachyons were measured uh, and they, they appeared as if they were bound to an ether, to a medium. And uh, that's it. So thanks for your time. Happy to take questions. Oh, interesting. I mean, maybe since I will need to leave earlier, maybe I will let myself uh, ask, uh, ask first. Hope everyone yeah, enjoyed it. Yeah, as always, very interesting. A bit provocative, but in fact, not too much. So maybe let me just start with one comment that, in fact, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the flash, uh, like from my perspective, the flash of this model is the dynamical uh, picture of physics. And then the question how using these dynamics we can count uh, distance and, uh, and time. And so, in fact, you don't really need too much to look at the, at the formal propagation and the wave phenomena. I mean, look, you could uh, say compare how your bats measure time by having one that sits still and each time his sonic clock ticks, put some marble in a box and the other moving. And then they simply, in the end, look at their boxes, how much marbles they collect that they don't need, need between each other, kind of, you know, communicate with, with, uh, with each other. But um, yeah, obviously this is all uh, constructed on the premise of using a, a sound wave. So of course, uh, yeah, I, I acknowledge that is crucial. And I guess it is true that it's the same in, in special relativity that the fact that electromagnetic waves is what keeps the matter bound, it's we can't really neglect it. And that can be um, yeah. kind of abstracted away. So now I have um, well, context to our question, because uh, you mentioned that oh, if you have astronauts and they like toss a ball, this would not be subject to sonic relativity. I mean, in some sense, I, I see uh, what you are saying, but then uh, perhaps this is an interesting exercise for this model to see you know, what's going on. So let's say uh, you have these bouncing, uh, bouncing guys and they have a sonic clock to which they synchronize their bouncing. So they have sonic clock and each time the cl sonic clock ticks, yeah. they bounce a ball. So they are different phenomena, but they are really synchronized. So they have this collocated clock. So let's say it's really the same spot. So we, we don't uh, uh, kind of we, we don't run into any problem with uh, you know, uh, comparing clocks at different locations. Uh, and then there is a moving bat. Uh, and then again, if we if we say okay, each time the sonic clock ticks and the ball bounces, they put some you know the bat puts a marble in a pocket, and one of the astronauts you know stop. Anyway, I guess I'm trying to make an argument, you know, there's some, some counting going on. And then uh, if it goes for, for, uh, for some fixed time for, for the bat and the astronauts, then there is a matter of fact how many, that there will be equal no amount of these tokens that they're going to set aside and equal number of ticks um, of the sonic and the bat and the astronauts. It's, it's, it's simply you know, okay. a logical state. So they are synchronized and the same number of ticks. So then when you have a moving bat 
Okay. They yeah. will have to assign the same. I mean, yeah, they will have to recover from rel and the, the sonic relativity the same phenomenon for the ball and for a sonic clock. No, they they won't they won't recover the same phenomenon for the ball because because I'm talking about. Um, so if you tried to do, if you try to make a light clock out of, if you try to make a bouncy ball clock. You will not see any time dilation if you do it at not at uh, speeds, you know, much less than than C. If you use Newtonian physics, you see no time dilation, you see no length contraction. But so and imagine, it's because so the ball bounce, it's because the ball does it's because the ball does not always travel at the same speed, but sound does. Okay, but so how do they explain the following? There is there is a bat that is held by the yeah. lower astronaut. I mean, the the, the okay. he has a sonic clock. And each time the sonic clocks make a tick. I mean, they they practice. Oh no no no! The, the, sonic, no. the, the scale the scale is wrong here. So the sonic clock is the same size as this ball clock, and the whole thing is shrunk down. And you zoom out. So so it. I mean the the the, the one of the astronauts is not a clock on its own, and it cannot have a sonic clock on its own. That's too small. So there this, is an extended sonic clock. So there is a back at the location of one astronaut and the other. Yes. You know, yes. there, there is so, a sound okay. bouncing between you. them. And they, yep. you know what I mean? I mean, there is a method of fact, if they synchronize yes. a sound wave between each other Absolutely. to the ball, yes. Yes. that has to remain true also for a passing by bed. Okay, okay, so here's here's Like logically, it, it, it has to stay okay. the, yeah. All right, okay. so let me try to answer your question so that you can go to your thing. So um, if yes. you have, let's make it simple. You just have one observer, well, okay. Let's put these guys in a line. So you have an observer here that tosses a ball to another observer. Um, then you have uh, uh, sound clocks and sound rulers in between. So you have a sonic reference frame that's established between them. But now suddenly one of them gets access to a lump of matter and tosses it to the other one. And the other one tosses it in this direction. They'll be able to see velocity dependent differences. So depending on which way the ball is tossed, they'll see a different thing because of the way the clocks are synchronized, because of the way everything's set up. The ball does not respect sonic Lorentz symmetry. It will break it. Yeah, I, I understand and, that. I just wonder about, because I, I think you don't object that it's in principle possible to set it such that each time a sonic a, a sound wave bounces between the astronauts, a ball bounces between the astronauts. I think, I mean, it's yes. not against sonic relativity to have something like this. This means that no, each time not. the sound wave bounces, the astronaut can make a green mark and each time the ball bounces, they can make a black mark somewhere. And then yes. it's a matter of fact that the number of these marks is always equal. No, you know, they, they have a sonic paper. I mean, so you object that it's, no, it's not possible yeah, to bounce no, the ball not. at the fixed rate between these, uh, between these astronauts? Well, it depends on Are how, you, objecting how to, you operate. Yeah, I, I, I'm a, I mean, the problem is that, okay. Here's here's the thing. If if you give, we got to put it in this framework. If all they have access to is the exchange of sound pulses, if they don't have access to a ball to toss back and forth, if, let's start with the bats. If the bats do not have access to a ball to toss back and forth, then they will not be able to measure their speed with respect to the ether. If you yeah, give them absolutely. a ball to toss back and forth, yeah. I know. But if you give them a ball to toss back and forth, they will be able to measure their speed with respect to an ether, to the ether. But I mean, I, I don't. But, let's say we don't care whether they can. Let's say that we don't care. We just okay, set it we up. We try to such, make it so that they don't. Yeah, exactly. Don't. I mean, we just make it such that each time the the sound bounces, also the ball bounces. Uh, yeah, you, and you could do we, that. You'd have to change. You'd have to change the speed at which the ball is thrown. So you could do that. Right. You could change the speed yeah, at which the so ball I, is thrown, but you'd have to change it, but that would be a velocity dependent choice that you're making. You'd have to adjust I, so the then, speed forward and backward of the ball. Yeah, yeah. So I guess, yeah, because what I was essentially, yeah, what I'm, what, the only thing I'm trying you to get from this, I mean, it's not a, it doesn't, it's a contradiction. It's just that then from the point of view of a moving bat, the sonic, um, I mean, the, the, the rules that they will use to describe uh, both the ball and, and the other bat must, must be yes. such that they will also see them bouncing together, but yeah, presumably yes. they will have some additional 
So yeah, it's a little bit like your scattering. They're, they will must have some reason for which yes. this ball not obeying relativity is actually also slowing down, but it must be a different reason. And maybe what you say is that they will see the four, the, the speeds being somehow. The, um, yes, affected. that's how yeah, it, that's I'm, I'm not, it is. Yeah, I'm so not sure. Maybe this the is the, the right. speed will be different. Yeah. Yeah, they, they'll, have to, they'll have to modify the initial speed, but more importantly, this astronaut will have to know how fast she's moving with respect to the ether in order to throw the ball at the right speed. So there it is already. Yeah, yeah, that, exactly. Yeah, that's an ether measuring uh, exercise. But yeah, I, th I think this is a, uh, yeah, because again, this is all, uh, it, it's not a contradiction for the model, it's just, no. Uh, yeah, I guess it yeah. uh, helps uh, uh, see uh, yeah. what's going, I mean, yeah, what's going yeah, on for very them, which very intriguing. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, yeah, it's very unfortunate, I'll have to switch off, but. Uh, um, yeah, I'll actually, uh, if there is one, when there is a recording available, I'll uh, have a look at the discussion. After. Great. And, uh, yeah, maybe yeah, we can talk more about it. Yeah, Fantastic. yeah, thanks, Nick, again. This is uh, always uh, a fun to, to listen. Great, happy cool. to do it. Thanks for the question. All right, and I see everyone. Right. See you. Bye. Um, other people can stick around and ask questions if you want. Um, you mentioned that, like, radon, right one of the assumptions is the bats can't measure any Doppler effects. Would that break anything if they could? Yeah, it would, because if they, so if they can measure a Doppler, first of all, oh, actually, now that, okay, hang on, I spoke way too soon. <laughs> Let me think about that. Um, so if they used a sound clock to measure a Doppler shift, they would see a relativistic Doppler shift and there it wouldn't break anything. If they used a matter-based clock or their heartbeat or something like that to measure a Doppler shift, then that would break it. So it's not the measuring of the Doppler shift that's the, pro that's the problem, it's what is your frequency reference? Cool. Laura, I think you cut out there briefly. Did you, was that cool? Yeah, I just said question? cool. Uh, okay, all right, great. It's time. Yeah. Anyone else? No, everyone's very happy with the tachyons. Surprise. Yeah, that actually reminds me of something Dan and I calculated like, at the start of our PhDs, where we had a really? ship going twice the speed of light and everything was just nice and normal. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah, I bet there's some literature on these possibilities. We're going to have to dig through it to find out. Right now, we're just talking about sonic observers, so it's a little easier, but we'll want to say something about eventual possibilities of observing tachyons. In fact, there, there were a number of papers around the time that people thought neutrinos were tachyonic that tried to do some of this stuff, uh, tried to make it all fit. So that was kind of a fun time for whatever, a year, year or so, however long it took. Any other questions, comments? Um, is this paper going to be on the archive soon? Um, I really hope so. Yeah. Um, we have a draft, but uh, we, um, I'll give you a slight backstory. We, we started looking at what happens if you have um, more than one medium with different speeds of sound. And then we thought, okay, well, we can put them in relative motion, right? Well, no, that actually turns out to be a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we spent a long time arguing about whether we can do that. And um, it, it turns out it gets, it, it's more subtle and more complicated. And it looks like a gravitational field because, you know, that's the whole analog gravity thing. But if you have flowing material, then that represents something gravitational. And so we would just want to do special relativity and we just want to illustrate the point. So we, okay. we may briefly talk about more than one material, but they need to be mutually at rest. And so that's, that's been the holdup. We're, we're almost done now. Anything else?
Who's in two weeks? I am. Dominic. All right. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, I guess, I guess that's probably it then, yeah?